Well, on an evening when our thoughts are very much with people and events many miles away, we join you on BBC Two tonight while the coverage of the war in the Gulf continues on BBC One. This is the first Crime Watch of 1991, of course. Last year, we appealed for information on 123 serious crimes, one in five of which was solved directly as a result of phone calls from viewers. And our thanks to everyone who called. This is the number to ring if you can help us on any of tonight's cases. While well, last month's programme was still on the air, police became pretty sure they were on the trail of the man who abducted and raped a 17-year-old woman. You may remember she bravely described what happened after she left a disco in West London. Eventually, as a direct result of viewers' calls that night, and there were nearly 300 of them, a man was charged with her kidnapping and rape. He's also been charged with another rape and abduction. Our first case tonight is a very sad one. The murder of former headmaster Ron Harrison. He was found dead at his home in Plumstead in South East London on Wednesday the 7th of November. Our reconstruction begins at his house three days before that on Sunday, November the 4th. Ron Harrison had just celebrated his 52nd birthday. The deputy headmaster at Wallington remembers Ron with affection. He worked extremely hard for the school. Um, it was his whole life. He lived and breathed Wallington boys. And I think he worked too hard um, and finally it ruined his health and he was forced to seek early retirement in March 1990. It was evident that he'd done an extremely good job since his arrival at the school um, and was very well respected by boys and staff and parents alike. He was a very popular headmaster and a charismatic figure, able to hold the attention of boys and parents and staff. I think his one regret at being a headmaster was that he would have to give up classroom teaching because right until the end, this remained his first real love. It was no coincidence that the church he attended was, was St Paul's at Deptford, uh, where he was able to help the underprivileged youngsters. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. He was a deeply religious man. And it wasn't all dogma and theory with him. He practiced what he preached. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle In fact, Ron Harrison had read the lesson that Sunday morning. Hello. Uh, Rosie. Oh, you know, OK, OK, how are you? In the evening, the school secretary who'd worked with him no, rang as she did every day to see how he was. No, I, I don't think so. I think I'll just watch a little uh, TV and then have an early night. But half an hour later, a taxi was called to pick up Ron and two teenage boys. Well, I picked him up about 27, quarter to seven on that night. The two boys were about 17, 18 years of age. Um, Cockney accents, a um, little bit leery. A little bit full of herself. Oh, God, where is he? What a nonce. Well, come on, will ya? Ron Harrison come out afterwards. He was very drunk. Uh, uh, Barclays in Woolwich. I want you to wait for me and bring me back. All right. on the Barclays Bank. Um, he kept giving me directions all the way there, which really got yes. me nose a bit. Straight on through the lights. And I think I know the way after about 10 years of cabin. What's he been on? Uh, he's been on tablets and drinking and all. <laughs> <laughs> State of that silly bastard. <laughs> I did feel that the two boys um, had seen Ron Harrison before. This wasn't the first time that they'd seen him. 
they was just too cocky around him. You know, they wasn't shy of him or anything. They, you know, they just as though they was like not friends, but they knew each other. It, it wouldn't give me any money. Paid me five pound. Fair was four pound. He gave me a pound tip. It's very unusual. The driver dropped all three passengers back at Ron's house. At dinner this week. Um, yes. I when think a friend so. called about, forty-five um, minutes later, Friday. Ron sounded sober. Good. This seems to have been the last time any of his friends yes. spoke I... to him. It was about half past eleven when the next door neighbour remembers his baby woke up. As I was going up the stairs and got to the, to the landing at the top, I noticed there was a bit of noise coming from next door. There sort of bumping noises that, that more or less sounded like heavy footfalls. On the other side, Albert Britton went into the garden to smoke a last pipe before bed. I saw the light was on, and then a shadow crossed the window. That looked like Ron. And a few seconds afterwards, another shadow crossed behind it. So I don't know who anybody else could be there. Whatever had happened that Monday night, the following morning, someone was seen in the house wearing a rugby shirt. And Ron Harrison didn't own a rugby shirt. That Tuesday afternoon, a builder arrived. Ron had asked him to do some decorating. The shutters were now drawn. No one answered the door. Yet at about five o'clock, the shutters were open again, and somebody was watching television in the dark. Was it Ron or someone else? Mr. Harrison? Mr. Harrison? On Wednesday morning, Margaret Parker arrived to clean the house. Ron had been strangled, his ribs had been broken, and he'd been tortured. Police believe he'd been murdered here in the front bedroom and then carried through to his own bedroom at the back of the house. The words Ron had read in St Paul's Church the previous Sunday now seem sadly prophetic. And there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Well, Mr Allen, do you know exactly when Ron was murdered? I believe he was murdered on the Monday night, that's the Guy Fawkes night. We know that he was tortured before he died. There were wounds, cut wounds, inflicted on his legs and his face and his ribs were broken. And I believe that the two shapes Mr Britton saw were in fact his killers taking his body into his bedroom. Now it seems quite possible that at least one person was still in the house the day after that and the two teenage boys being the last people known to have kept his company are presumably the prime suspects. Yes they are and I'm very very anxious to speak to them obviously. I can tell you that Mr Harrison was in fact gay and we know from what the taxi driver has told us that it was obvious he knew these two boys. Now, we don't know if he was having a relationship with them, but I need to see them so that I can clarify this matter with them. And I'd urge them, or any members of the gay community in particular who know him, or know these two boys, to come and speak to me and my team in the absolute strictest confidence, and it will be in confidence. What descriptions do you have of the two boys? The taxi driver's given you descriptions of one in particular that uh, you've been able to make a video fit. Yes, the, the descriptions are very similar actually. They're both lads are aged about 17 or 18, between 5 foot 7 and 5 foot 9 inches tall. Both boyish looking with fresh complexions. 
and we can see the video fit up there now. And I'd say that, bear in mind, this was constructed by the cab driver who only saw the boy in his rear view mirror. So we can say that the hair is absolutely accurate, but perhaps the rest of the face leaves a little bit to be desired. Mm. Now, certain items were missing from the house too. Yes, they were. Um, Ron's Barclay card in particular in his name was taken together with some cash. But the most important thing where I feel your viewers can in fact help us is concerning other items, namely two television sets. One was a 14-inch Philip television set. As you can see, the serial numbers are up on the screen now. And the first one is PM008943-15400. And the other one was a 14-inch Decker, serial number 2537874. I'd urge anybody that's come into possession of one of these in slightly dubious circumstances since the 5th of November last year to just get up now and look on the back and see what the serial numbers are. And if they match these, please telephone us now. I can tell those people that if they have dishonestly handled these televisions, they will be granted immunity from any prosecution provided they can help us. Well, Mr Allen, thank you very much indeed. There are, in fact, a number of people here tonight to answer calls on this particular case. Nick. There's sometimes uh, a, a, an understandable reluctance on the part of members of the gay community to identify themselves to the police. But if you want, when you call into Crime Watch this evening, you can ask to speak to a member of Gallup, that's the Gay London Policing Group. Jeremy Clark, how can you help tonight? Well, a part of our role is to act as an intermediary between the police and the lesbian and gay community. And in this case, if callers have information but are reluctant to speak directly to the police, then they can speak to us and we can guarantee that their identity will be protected if that's what they wish. Really guarantee? What happens if the police say, look, we think this call is crucial, we really want you to give the name and address of this person? Mm -hmm. Well, we work with the police on this because our aim is the same, which is to solve this particular crime. And the police respect that our role is to guarantee confidentiality so that we get as much information through as possible. OK, well, if you uh, can shed any light on who killed Ron Harrison, you can ask to speak to Jeremy or one of his colleagues from Gallup or indeed a BBC researcher. Here's the number, 081 811 8181. Or you can ring the Metropolitan Police direct. The number there is 071 230 That's 071 230 well, now some more news from last month's Crime Watch. Our Aladdin's Cave of Stolen Property surpassed all previous programmes in the number of reclaimed possessions. Nearly 700 people rang to say they recognised items, and out of the 1,500 pieces we showed, one-third have now been returned to their owners. The tea caddy, just for example, was spotted by a woman who has now since been reunited with no fewer than 120 treasured possessions, which she thought were gone forever. As for the police, they now have 15 new burglaries to work on. Crime Watch reconstructions rarely dwell on what takes place behind closed doors, but sometimes the behaviour of offenders can be revealing. And in the case that follows, police are anxious to trace not only witnesses, but anyone who recognises the assailants from the way that they went about their task. The crime is a robbery in Bristol, in the fish ponds area, and the victim was a wholesale jewel merchant and his assistant. We've changed his name and some of the details for security reasons. These are the gold chains you were asking about. There's a couple of new lines in here that I think you'll oh, find quite... Uh... Terry Brown is a wholesale trader of gold and jewellery. Yeah. What, what are they programmed now? As it's you. Say 385, shall we? Oh, that's good. Yeah. Quite a nice way. Yeah. yeah, I'll have those. I'll leave it at that at the moment. Right. Yeah. That's fine. Well, okay. I'll be popping around again on Friday so I can see how those lines are going. OK. Lovely. See you soon. Operating from home, he trades to jewellery stores in Bristol and the southwest of England, often carrying his samples in a brown suitcase. It's Thursday, the 29th of November, the day before the robbery. Lodge Causeway is a shopping street in Bristol, close to Terry Brown's home. At about 12.30, three men approached the Causeway's snack bar. Can I help you, please? Uh, yeah. Um, I have sausage, egg and chips for three. Sausage, egg and chips for three, please, car. That'll be three ninety, my love, please. Oh, uh, 
flip my money in the van. Yeah. I'll have to come back. Cancel that order, Kev. The men never did come back. But did you see them, or do you know where they went? Next day, Friday, was a busy morning for Mr. Brown, working at home with his assistant. At lunchtime, he went out for an appointment. All right, I'm off then. All right, I just got those rings to do. You leave them till Monday. I just finish them. Okay, have a good weekend. Bye. See you. I've been working for him for about a year and doing bookkeeping and invoicing. And that Friday after he had gone, I noticed the blue van pull up outside. The driver came round the side and opened the door and took some flowers out of the van. It was nothing unusual because we often get deliveries. No, I just work here. Well, I've got these flowers for her and some parcels out in the van. Right, go! What are you doing? Do him over. Where's the suitcase? I don't know. Someone's got it in the car. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Look upstairs. Right. Where's the suitcase? Tell him. I said, where's the suitcase? I told you, I don't know. I don't know. He must have it. Where's the officer? Out the back. Through that door over there. Keep hold of her. Right. What have you got there? Come on, I want to know. I'm disabled. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't know. I'm sorry I never realized. My knees are shaking. Oh, well. Uh, sit down. Oh, come on, take it easy. You'll be okay. There you go. Come on. There you go. There. There. Are you all right? Look. Where's the suitcase? I told you, don't know. Found it? No. Coffer. No. I'll do it. It'll be all right. Oh, come on, that's not bloody good enough. No, she'll be all right. She'll be all right. Go. Him crumpling the paper reminds me of um, when my dad used to light the fires, you know, used to scrunch the paper up. And I was uh, just frightened that uh, they were going to set the house alight or something. You're not going to set fire to the house, are you? The robbers found the suitcase and got away with jewellery and gold worth several thousand pounds. Peter Coombs, what do we know about those robbers? Well, what we do know about them is the, the first one, he seemed to be very agitated and nervous, but he was also the leader. He was exceptionally short. He was five foot four, which is short for a man. He was stockily built and he wore a light coloured anorak and dark trousers. He was also wearing a tweed cap. The second man, about the same age group, 45 to 50 that is, um, he was five foot nine, stockily built. He wore a light coloured polyester type material jacket, which was about thigh, thigh length. He was the one who was fairly sympathetic. He was the sympathetic man, yes, he was very sympathetic, um, who handcuffed the lady to the dining room chair. The third man we know very little about, we believe he's in the same age group. 
Now, the van itself is pretty distinctive. It's very distinctive, as the viewers can see. It's a um, Volkswagen LT31 model, which is about transit size. That's the real registration, of that course. That is the real registration number. Um, what we do know about it is about 88, 89, 1989, this was registered to someone who lived in the Deptford and Tottenham areas of uh, London. Uh, we also know the evidence suggests that uh, it's been seen in uh, Camberley and Surrey and also in Christchurch and Dorset. And it's got a pretty distinctive roof rack. The roof rack, yeah. Purpose-built thing, something that uh, a, mar a market trader might well use to uh, put his uh, stall on and so on. Now, the handcuffs, not, they can be uh, got anywhere all over the place, but just if somebody relates these to... Uh, any of those three men, and of course the flowers. The flowers. The flowers, in fact, were made up of chrysanthemums and carnations, and we'd like to know any florist, particularly in the Bristol area, um, who can recall on that day, Friday the 30th of November, making up those flowers. OK, the jeweller would like us to point out he no longer trades from home. Now, if there's any way that you can help with this, here's the number, 081 811 or you can call the CID in Bristol, they're on 0272 267784. That's 0272, the code for Bristol, 267784. Eight, four. Well, there are three cases on our incident desk this month, and here, as usual, are Detective Constable Jackie Hames and Superintendent David Hatcher. North London Police need your help to find out who was responsible for an attack in Hampstead which turned into a murder. The victim was Richard Barry, a 25-year-old London University student. He died in hospital two days after the attack, which happened in the early hours of Sunday, November the 18th. Richard had left a party in Haverstock Hill near Belsize Park Tube Station at about 3 a.m. As he walked up Rosslyn Hill towards Hampstead Tube Station, he was set upon and beaten about the head with a two-foot long piece of wood. Despite his injuries, he staggered a further 500 yards up the hill to Heath Street, where he was discovered, slumped and bleeding, and was taken to hospital. Richard could only give a confused account of what had happened. He talked of three men, one of them black, and a Ford Cortina car, possibly blue. He also said he'd met a man outside a tube station who had demanded money. We've very little to go on and are hoping someone watching tonight remembers seeing Richard. He was wearing this distinctive Fez type hat, a dark bomber jacket and jeans. If you saw something, however insignificant it may seem, that's between 3 and 4 a.m. on November the 18th, please ring. Colleagues from the RUC in Belfast are looking for this man who last year carried out a serious assault on a 15-year-old girl. It was on Monday the 1st of October when just before 9pm the girl left her friend's house in Andersonstown, West Belfast to walk home. As she walked along a busy route, Glen Road, she passed two teenage boys walking in the opposite direction. If that was you, please ring. You might well have seen her attacker, for as she passed the entrance to the Christian Brothers Secondary School, a man grabbed her from behind. She managed to turn and get a good look at him. She describes him as 30 to 35, about 5 foot 10, with a slim build. He was wearing a grey or blue jacket with a zip-up front and bleached jeans. And he had very rough hands. During the assault, he tried to push her over the school railings, but she kept fighting and finally he gave up and ran off. At St Mary's, a local school further along Glen Road, there was a rehearsal for a play which ended at about 9.30. If you were leaving then, you may have seen the man running away. My Belfast colleagues need to speak to anyone in the Glen Road area who may have seen him that night. They are very worried that this man may attack again. You may remember last summer reading about the disappearance of Nicholas Whiting, a garage owner from Kent. He was abducted from his garage premises on the 7th of June and his body was found a month later at Raynham Marshes in Essex. That was on the 2nd of July. He'd been shot and stabbed. His watch was missing and it could lead us to his killer. It was a Rolex Submariner watch like this, except the face was black. It's unusual, we think there are only three or four black ones in the country and it's worth about £5,000. If you've bought one since June, check the serial number under the strap. 918-9612 is the number on the watch that's missing. You may well have bought it in all innocence, but it could prove to be a vital clue to what is still a baffling murder. If you have any information on this, or indeed any of our other incident desk cases, please ring us now. And here's the number. As I say, if you can help with any of those cases, 081 811 81 That's 081 811 8181. Our next appeal is an unusual one for Crime Watch. It involves the murders of two young women, both of which were committed more than 20 years ago, back in 1970. 
but murder investigations are never considered closed until they're solved. And Cheshire and Derbyshire police have just decided to combine forces in a renewed effort to solve these two cases. The investigating officers believe that now 20 years have passed, witnesses who may have withheld information then for various personal reasons may now feel they can tell police what they know. Let it be, let it be, let it be, let it be. Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. And when the broken hearted people living in the world agree, there will be an answer, let it be. During 1970, two young women were murdered within seven months. Jackie Ansel Lamb was 18 years old and Barbara Mayo was 24. Each had left London to hitchhike north on motorways. This is a very familiar place to me, these woods, as I live barely a stone's throw from here, the woods where Barbara Mayo was killed many, many years ago. And so being so familiar, these woods, the killing of Barbara was, is never, ever far away, even on a daily basis. She was killed along this track just into the woods a short way. In 1970, as a young detective constable, David Doxey was assigned to Barbara's murder investigation. Twenty years later, he's still on the case, but now in charge of the inquiry. This is where Barbara Mayer was murdered. Her body was actually found a short way into the wood here by some local people who were out chestnutting on the Sunday afternoon. She'd been brutally assaulted. She'd been raped and she'd been strangled to death, a most dreadful crime. Uh, this is the uh, last place that Jackie Ann Salem was uh, seen in March of 1970. It's a transport cafe just off the M6 near Warrington in Cheshire. And at that time, I was a newly appointed detective constable and was seconded onto the inquiry to assist in the murder investigation. The murder of Barbara Mayo is, was an infamous crime and is well and truly ingrained into local folklore in these parts. Oh, we try harder. Yes, we do. If you lump it all together. Can you tell me what you got, baby? Well, you got a recipe for a little long steam. Oh, what a beautiful dream. There we go! Come on, come on, come on! Barbara Mayo was an English graduate, but hadn't yet decided on a full-time career. She had hitchhiked her way around Europe and was now earning money in London by trading cars. She'd just arranged to collect a car from a garage in Yorkshire. Hello. Hello, yes, it's Barbara Mayo. Yes, about the Mini. I just want to know what time you close tonight. No, 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 that's fine, 7.30. Yep, I'll come up today. Tripping. On the morning of Monday the 12th of October, 1970, she left her London flat to hitchhike north on the M1. She never arrived at the garage. Barbara's body was found off the M1 near Chesterfield. Derbyshire police immediately contacted Scotland Yard. A senior detective was dispatched from London to lead the murder hunt. Chief Superintendent Charlie Palmer decided on an unprecedented move. He brought the entire M1 to a virtual standstill. For a whole day, every vehicle at every junction along the 150 mile length of the motorway was stopped and checked. Everyone was a possible suspect. He then staged a reconstruction for the media. Today's reconstruction of Barbara Mayer's last journey began in Rockley Road, Hammersmith, at number 40 Rockley Road, the murdered girl's home. The girl, you can see, is dressed in the actual clothing of Barbara Mayo, who was murdered a short distance from the 2-9 intersection of the M1 motorway on Monday, the 12th of October. She is carrying a replica of the handbag Girl was Mr. Palmer, is there, any, is there any appeal you want to make to young people who might be thinking of hitchhiking up the M1? Don't. The publicity led to more than 700 reported sightings of Barbara. One in particular that police thought significant in the town of Kimberley, just off the M1 in Nottinghamshire. William Army was returning home from work and we passed the Morris Traveller parked in crossroads. A little bit further on, there was a nice-looking girl thumbing a lift. I said to him, if I hadn't got you with me, 
I would give her a lift. Looking through my mirror, I saw the Morris Traveller pick her up. They followed us down to the M1, and that's where I lost sight of them. I'm sure the girl in the Morris Traveller was Barbara Mayo. At that time, there were some 100,000 Morris Travellers on the road in Britain. Police tried to trace every one of them. For a year, the murder incident room in Chesterfield ran at full strength. This was a vast inquiry at the time, in back in 1970-71. Probably the biggest single murder hunt ever mounted by one police force. We still keep all the files, the indexes. Certainly over 120,000 people were interviewed by the police. And we keep all the vehicles on the cards, over 130,000 of them. I would say that he was what, probably what about five foot four. He's, uh, Today, there's still a small team of officers working on Barbara Mayo's murder investigation. Recently, they began looking into similarities with the murder of another hitchhiker in 1970, that of Jackie Ansel Lamb. Jackie used to carry a Japanese Airlines bag because the initials were the same as hers. She was 18 and very much a 60s teenager. On Sunday the 8th of March 1970, a young man she'd just met dropped her off at one of the London slip roads to the M1. If I had the money, I'd lend you the train fare. It's all right, forget it. It's just I don't like you hitching all that way. No, I said it's all right. Do you want my phone number? No, no. Here's mine. Give us a ring sometime. She was heading back to Manchester, where she worked as a secretary. Jackie shared a lift with another hitchhiker 50 miles up the M1 to Buckinghamshire. But how she travelled further north from there isn't known. What we do know is that between 9 and 10 p.m. that Sunday night, Jackie arrived here at the Poplar Cafe, which is just off junction 20 of the M6 near Warrington, and she was seen in the company of a man. There are a number of people who saw them here on that evening 20 years ago, and one of them, Delia Brown, is still employed here. Now, I remember very vividly, there was a man come through the door, he went up to her, and then he came up for two coffees. He was smartly dressed, business-like clothing. And within seconds, I went back down there to look around, and he was sitting with her, talking. <laughs> We're up there about half an hour or more. And I remember them going through the door and I could see it was a car she got into. Just off the M6 in woods near that cafe, a farm worker found Jackie's body. Like Barbara Mayo, she'd been raped and strangled. Although police are by no means sure they're looking for one man, there are certainly striking similarities between the murders of Jackie Ansel Lamb and Barbara Mayo. And now, 20 years on, David Doxey believes that far from being a disadvantage, the passage of time could now help the inquiry. I'm absolutely convinced that people still hold information that could take our inquiry forward. I know that some people chose to mislead us many years ago, especially in relation to alibis. Let me say I'm not interested in pursuing legal actions against people who, for one reason or another, chose to mislead us all those years ago. Our main aim is to catch the killer. And to that end, David Doxey is here. David, you've kept in touch with Barbara Mayo's family all these years. Do you really believe that it's not too late now to, for this new appeal? Yes, we're always hopeful. We had a lot of publicity in October, um, the 20 years and a sad anniversary, of course, of Barbara's murder. And from that publicity, the public responded most encouragingly. They were able to give us information which provided a number of lines of inquiry. As a result of that, we've raised the incident room again at Chesterfield, and it's active now. Uh, the lines of inquiry in the main concern the provision of false alibis and checking them out again. 
uh, and also in relation to people who we are told had cuts or scratches or grazers at that particular time, seen by people, and they were not truly accounted for. And so they harboured those suspicions over the years, but now they feel free to tell us. So and the those are the lines of inquiry. Sorry, the information is obviously there. Why do you think people didn't come forward in the, in the first place? I think it's a natural reaction and most understandable that people don't contact the police and provide information. I do understand it. They, they think that their information is perhaps too trivial or they will be made to look foolish. I urge them to put those fears to one side. I really don't believe that only the killer has the identity to Barbara's death and I would urge those that have information to please contact us if for no other reason than to remove the anguish from the close family members of, of Barbara and perhaps Jackie. Well, Lawrence Mellor, you've been in touch in turn with Jackie Anselm's Lamb's family all this time too. Would you agree with that? Yes, and I'm extremely hopeful that we will receive some very good information uh, tonight. Is there any new evidence now that can help jog people's memories all those years ago? Yeah, at this stage, uh, we feel that we have everything to gain and nothing to lose and I'm able to disclose a vital piece of evidence which has not previously been made public because it was used by detectives to eliminate suspects. Forensic scientists who examined Jackie's body recovered several pieces of carpet fibre and examination of these fibres has shown that they're more likely to have come from a carpet roll or carpet sample rather than the vehicle in which she may have travelled. We know that on the weekend she was murdered, there had been a carpet exhibition at Earl's Court and that Jackie was seen with a man in the Poplar Cafe who was smartly dressed and uh, was described as a rep or a salesman. My own feelings are that Jackie's killer is likely to be a man who 20 years ago had some connections with the carpet industry and I would ask you that if anyone has been harbouring any doubts or suspicions about such a person, they contact us now. Well, gentlemen, I hope somebody tonight will come forward and solve these two cases for you after all this time. If you do feel you can now offer any help on either of these cases, please do ring the number, once again, 081 811 8181, or you can ring the incident room at Chesterfield on 0246 220100. That's 0246, the code for Chesterfield, 220100. I have to say, the volume of call tonight is, uh, is fairly low. It's not always indicative of quality, the likelihood of getting strong leads from them. We have had several names given for suspects in the Ronald Harrison murder, uh, but uh, pretty clearly news from the Gulf is dominating most people's thoughts, and uh, the move to BBC Two presumably hasn't helped. But we've two hours here till the phone lines close, so please keep calling. Uh, we do hope that we'll have more to tell you when we come back on the air later on. That'll be about ten past midnight. That's Crime Watch Update here on BBC Two again. But meanwhile, all the phone numbers are on page 618 of CFAX if you have that. Or you can still ring us here until the lines close at midnight. Uh, there's a lot to, to preoccupy us at the moment, of course. But whatever happens, don't have nightmares. Do please sleep well. Good night. Good night.